What a joy it is to be here on this, the uh, first Sunday after Epiphany, and uh, this is the day that we celebrate the uh, baptism of the Lord, and uh, we welcome you near and far. We welcome the folks, uh, some old friends have come up from Durham to see us, and so, some young friends that we've known for a long time have come up to see us uh, from Durham, and so we're glad to have you with us uh, today. So behave, everybody else, because they're going to take it back what they see. Um, uh, so uh, Carter, our intern, would be here, but he, like uh, so many folks in our world and country, he tested positive for COVID this last week. So he's uh, observing the protocols. It's very mild, very, very mild case, and we're thankful for that. Um, uh, but please uh, keep him in prayer. He is participating in the service today uh, by having written a prayer uh, for us. So I'll be reading that a little bit later on, the opening prayer today. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to let you know that uh, Thursday morning Bible studies have, uh, are going to begin again this coming Thursday at 10 o'clock in the library. And um, so anyone is welcome to attend. We're studying the book of Colossians, and it's very much a group that, uh, that would welcome you. If you've never been to a Bible study before, uh, we'll, we'll help you and start uh, wherever you might be and answer all your questions and, and um, figure out God's word together. So you're invited to that. Um, also wanted to let you know the church council is meeting uh, this Monday evening, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock p.m., and we welcome uh, the newcomers to the council, those that have rotated on, and we're grateful for those that have rotated off. Uh, we're especially grateful. Uh, Alan Hicks is the new chairperson for the council, and so this will be his first meeting uh, with that uh, chairpersonship uh, as he uh, leads us. We'll be talking about some things, especially looking into the spring, even though it's difficult to plan in light of COVID, uh, thinking about Lenten luncheons and trying to discern that, uh, things like the Palm Sunday breakfast, uh, things, just all kinds of things. It's hard, but we'll try and discern together what God uh, is leading us toward. And then this morning, we have a, uh, uh, <clears throat> a special announcement about a fundraiser that's upcoming. And I just, I love the whole thing about the announcement because it's someone offering their gifts to, to lift up and build the church uh, and glorify God. So Lori Burnett, uh, you and Keith are some of our newer attenders and members and, and uh, would love to have you come and share with us what's on your heart. Thank you. Sound people, we'll need to switch to the, um, to the mics here at the pulpit. Good morning. Good morning. Um, many of you probably noticed the design of my shirt. Has, it, it has a heavy nod to the banner that usually hangs on this side for a great part of the year. And um, for the time that we've been coming to Law Memorial, we've almost always sat on this side. And whenever that banner's been here, I'd walk in and I'd see it and I'd read the top. And such a, a beautiful banner. And, and I'd read the top and behind it in my head, I'd say to myself, a child of God. And I love crafting and do a lot of it, do a lot of design stuff. And so I decided, well, I'm going to make a shirt because we're not supposed to deny who we are, right? And so I made the design, and I approached Pam, and I asked her if she would be interested in a fundraiser for the youth. Um, after I, in our circle group for the Methodist women and attending the executive committee meeting, um, where it had been discussed about since the youth have come back from um, our restrictions from COVID, that there were so many more children that were coming that their families didn't attend here and the concern was having enough money to pay for the, the food, the pizza and things that they buy for the youth to eat. And so um, that got on my heart because feeding them in their bellies also helps us feed them in their heart and in their soul. And so I wanted to use the gift of my crafts and that God put it on me to make the design that I wanted to do something for the youth program. And so I'm going to be making t-shirts and 100% of the profit from the first 100 shirts will go to feeding the youth on Sunday nights. And if I sell more than 100, then after 100, 50% of the profits will go to feeding the youth program for however many we sell. 
So there's an email Miss Peggy's going to be sending out tomorrow, maybe later today, I don't know, um, possibly tomorrow. But the email has um, one page for the adult shirts. I've offered a lot of different colors. There's adult short sleeve, there's adult long sleeve, there's a real soft cotton, there's a little bit more coarse cotton, like, I don't know about you other guys, people, but my husband prefers the thicker cotton shirts. I prefer the soft, comfy ones. Um, but there's some of each, both short sleeve and long sleeve. There's youth sizes, toddler sizes, and also onesies for babies. And I personally am going to be making a lot for baby showers because I think a little onesie for a baby shower that I'm a child of God would be something that you're not going to find many other people given. <laughs> um, so I did the black, the white on black, gold on navy. There's lots of color choices for the shirts. After the service today, I'll be in the library. I have almost every color that's on the list, but if you don't have time to stay or you're at home, the email that's coming out has all the colors, pictures of the colors, and the other options. There's an adult sheet, there's the youth and children's sheet, then there's an order form. I have some here for those who are here to get a, a physical form. And there's also an example of the order form of how to fill out the order form, also on the online. If you are adept at doing markup on forms, I'm more than happy for you to mark up digitally and email it to me instead of printing a form and trying to get it back to me. All orders that I get by next Sunday, I'll have ready and have them to be picked up um, at church or at the church office by Sunday, the 30th, which is two-week turnaround. Any orders after the 16th will also have a two-week turnaround, just will depend on whenever I get them. Because I've not made these ahead, I'm making them to order. You order the color, you tell me what color shirt you want, what size, I'll order the shirt when it comes in, I'll put the design on it and the color that you want it. So I don't want to have a whole lot of stock sitting around that I don't know if it will sell or not. But I do have almost all of the colors and you can fill the shirts in the library after the service. I also want to thank Becky Brand has volunteered to help me with the things that I'm going to have to do as far as sorting the shirts and weeding the vinyl and all that kind of stuff. And I, I very much appreciate her and Stump's friendship and, and her offering to help me do that. Any questions? <laughs> I appreciate your time and your support. Thank you, Lori. We appreciate you and offering your gifts uh, to come and, and uh, share and help our youth and uh, to make a good, what a great message. I'm a child of God. That's a message the world needs to hear and share. So we continue this morning uh, with our worship with the prelude, Shall We Gather at the River?
invite you to join in the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Gather from east and west, from north and south. God is calling us. Listen, for God is naming you. Bow in awe before the one who created you. God knows you completely, yet accepts you. God reaches out to strengthen, not condemn us. God brings us through terror to a place of peace. Let us pray this prayer that uh, Carter has shared with us. God, our Savior, we lift up praise to you alone this morning. The Lord, our God, the Holy One of Israel, our Savior. We praise your name, O God, for you are God alone from the very beginning until the very end. May we see this morning the moving of your spirit among us. May we encounter anew your promise for redemption. May we step boldly into the callings you have placed on our lives. God, we know that we are a people in need of a Savior, Christ our Savior, and we thank you for the calling to join his ministry of justice and righteousness and love. This morning, may we cling to the promises you made to us in our baptisms, that you will never leave us or forsake us, and that having been baptized, you send us out to preach that same promise with our very lives. And remind us, O God, that we are not alone in this journey, but that you are with us, and you've commissioned the body of Christ to be with us as well. So fill us up, Lord, to overflowing. May we experience your love and your spirit in this place. Amen. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Another's personal space, but uh, trying your best to share the peace of Christ with one another. And remembering this isn't just a time to say, hey, how are you doing? We're actually sharing the very peace of Christ, and that goes a long way. And you might even want to wave to the folks at home uh, through the cameras there. Peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Please be seated. We are going to um, forego the statement of faith and the Gloria Patri. That was one thing we learned. Uh, so you can thank the early service uh, for teaching me that the service ran a little bit long <laughs> with that in. So uh, we're going to move to affirm our baptismal uh, uh, 
covenant with one another. This is the baptism of our Lord Sunday, and I, I would invite you to turn in your hymnal to page 43 and just kind of put a finger there for a minute. We'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> there's a congregational response on page 43 uh, that we'll refer to. But as we remember our Lord's baptism, uh, we read the scripture from Luke 3, and then we're going to participate in this reaffirmation of our covenant. When we, uh, when we baptize someone, a baby or an adult, we as a congregation pledge to support them in their faith journey. And we have all done that. Every member of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Methodist Church, the Catholic Church, all the members of Christian churches have been baptized as well. And so we have pledged that for one another. And we have also received that prayer, that, that commitment from one another uh, to be prayed for and to be molded and shaped in our faith. And so we're going to remember that. Following the service, in addition to saying these words uh, at the exit in the narthex there, following the service, there'll be the, the bowl that usually resides here in the font uh, is filled with water and you're invited on the way out to, um, to take and dip your finger in the water and make the sign of the cross, remembering uh, your baptism and striving, kind of praying to God to live into that. And so that's what we're about to do. Uh, so... Um, uh, Hear this scripture first from Luke chapter 3, where John the Baptist answered Jesus by, uh, er, answered the crowds by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so now we turn to that covenant that we share. Uh, and I've modified the, the leader's portion, the pastor's portion just a little bit. But uh, you will respond after I give this invitation. Members of the household of God, I commend those in this congregation and this community to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Remember that while you pledge these things to others, others are pledging them towards you as well. We are one body of Christ, caring for one another and helping one another to grow in faith. And so we respond as a congregation. We give thanks for all that God has given you. And we welcome you in the Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And now may the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, may God establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now a song which most of us, I don't think, will need to... Uh, uh, refer to the words of. We're going to sing Jesus loves me, but we're going to change it just a little bit. And we're going to sing Jesus loves you. It's found on page 191 in your hymnals.
it, it's true. It, it's true. And if you get nothing else out of the service this morning, know that uh, that song is true for you. And as we express it towards one another, it's true for our neighbors as well. Now hear this scripture, which comes from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, the prophet. But now says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my sight and honored, I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. So do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We continue with our anthem, Spirit Song. the very airwaves to just continue in song. It's wonderful. Well, uh, it is uh, good to be together. I, I am reminded this morning, listening to this rousing uh, uh, 
scripture from Isaiah's prophecy about stories of adventures long past. Have you ever sat around a campfire or a dinner table or at a family reunion or with some old friends and just talked about the good old days, especially talking about the grand adventures that you go on? Um, adventures, they seem to get more and more grandiose and more heroic the more fires they are told around, don't you think? That it stretches some. Uh, it's a common thing, too, to gather and talk about the good old days with nostalgia, when life was simpler, when maybe our parents or grandparents may have struggled, but there was always food on the table. Part of what makes us human, I think, is telling those stories. But I would contend that adventures are often stories of grim survival in which enough time and distance has passed that we forget about the painful and the scary parts, uh, you know, or at least we can laugh about them. But when we're going through it, it's not so adventurous. It's life and death oftentimes. Looking back, we can put stories into a nice package with a tidy beginning and middle and end. We'll say uh, maybe, I remember that one time where we set out to visit grandma and we got caught in a blizzard and we spent the night a little cold, but in the morning they cleared the road and we made it. But in the present, I mean, this happened just this last week, didn't it? Uh, there's not enough distance. It's too close. If there's anyone here, I apologize. That, that If in, anyone here was on the road, I-95 up to Washington, D.C. last weekend, uh, it's too near, too close, too soon, I think, for me to tell this story as a past adventure. Imagine that you got in your car going up to grandma's house thinking the trip would take an hour. You have your newborn infant in the back seat in a car seat and 15 hours and a blizzard later, they're still maybe not clearing the road. You wondered probably at that time, will I have enough gas? Am I gonna freeze? What have I done? How is this gonna end? It's terrifying, it's terrifying. When you're going through it, you're not sure how you would make it. You know, none of the big textile mills here in Person County are still operating. Over time, those of you who were still, uh, who were there can remember perhaps the distress and the adjustments and the doubt and the faith stories when the mills closed. Probably many people had to move away in search of a livelihood or another job, uh, looking for work elsewhere elsewhere. But now enough time and distance has passed that you that live through it might be able to talk about it without a quiver in your voice. But then going through it, when word came out that the, the mill was going to close, I'll bet there was a gracious plenty worried dinner table conversations at the time saying, I just don't know what we're going to do. I'll bet there was more than one coffee can that had been filled with savings on top of the refrigerator or up on the top shelf that got spilled out at that time on the dining room table or on the bed saying, how far will this get us? Because the job that I had for so long is going away. It was just last week that we saw the story in the news that the QVC plant in Rocky Mount caught fire uh, in December, that it's going to be closed. There's around 2,000 folks that work there now unemployed. What? They, they had it all going for them in a sense. And all of a sudden the rug ripped out because of this, this disaster in their town. At those times, where do you go? What do you do? Where does your help come from? This morning, we listened to the prophet Isaiah. We often think of prophets as folks who can tell the future. In the Bible, prophets do sometimes tell the future, but more, more often than that, they are people who are called to speak for God. So sometimes they talk about what has already happened through God's eyes. So they might recount the story of God leading the people through the Red Sea and delivering them from the hand of the Egyptians. And sometimes the prophets in the Bible tell what is happening, such as calling out the corruption found in the government or even in the church with warnings that the leaders and the people need to repent and get right with God. And sometimes prophets in the Bible tell what will happen in the future on behalf of God as a warning, uh, a prediction of sorts that God conveys for some purpose. And Isaiah this morning in the passage that I read is prophesying about the future of God's people to whom he is writing, who are the Israelites. He is speaking for God to God's people about God, what God's people will endure and how it will ultimately turn out. 
Now, this passage in Isaiah was, read, was, was written a long time ago, 2,700 years ago-ish uh, is, is how long ago it was written. But still, even though it was written that long ago, it gives us a picture of the nature of God. This is what God says, what Isaiah writes. But now this is what the Lord says, who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. That's a powerful word. Fear not. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. It's easy to remember isn't it, that we belong to someone in the way we belong to, let's say, a loving grandparent or a parent who is looking after us when we are curled up in their lap. It's easy to know that we belong, right? I see a couple of little ones out there. There is no doubt in their mind that they belong to you as a family and what a blessing it is. It's easy to remember when we're curled up in a lap, this is good, I belong here, right? But it's not so easy when we are apart and the times aren't good. It's not so easy to remember that we belong to someone when we've done something that hurts or estranges the other, or when some force of nature or some malice of mankind has driven a wedge between us. It's easy to remember sitting here in this sanctuary that we belong to God and that we worship God. We're warm and cozy. We're surrounded by hugs and waves and friendly faces. Masks notwithstanding, these are the times when it's easy to remember that God loves us. But when disaster strikes, when winds topple steeples, or fires reduce sanctuaries to cinders, or floodwaters render our beloved places unsalvageable, or harsh words even and judgment echo in our ears, it's not so simple to remember that we belong. It's much harder. In those times, our questions turn to those like, why me? Why us? What did we do to bring this upon ourselves? Where will we go? Where are you, O oh God? What will become of us? In such moments, some choose to go it alone. Others, choose, they withdraw into hopelessness. Others channel their grief into anger and lash out to gain feelings of power or superiority. We might even, at such times of despair, encounter what authors have written for millennia. Uh, is called the dark night of the soul, as Jesus did when he cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Today, Isaiah gives these messages of hope. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. But at the same time, Isaiah is predicting the future that calamity is going to come. He's prophesying that it's going to get bad, really bad. But fear not. We may not seem to need words like these. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name and you are mine. We might not seem to need them when we are gathered together as a family. But we would do well to learn them and practice them while the going is good so that when the going turns not good, we have somewhere to turn. Many scholars believe Isaiah wrote the beginning of the book of Isaiah uh, in the short years before his nation, the, the nation of Israel, was wiped off the map by Assyria. And 150 years later, uh, Isaiah was also predicting that the southern kingdom of Judah would fall at the hands of the Babylonians. So from a time and place where the nation is still holding on, imagine things are still okay, things are still good. No one's invaded yet, no one has conquered us yet, things are still good. From that time and place, Isaiah writes that calamity will come, but God will not give up on God's people and will indeed regather them in the fullness of time. Imagine a graduation speech where the keynote speaker or the, the valedictorian says, doesn't say what is often said at graduation speeches, the world is at the tips of your fingers, so rise up and accomplish what we have empowered you to achieve. But rather imagine the keynote speaker says, a year after you graduate today, all will seem lost. 
It's going to be a disaster and a train wreck. So suck it up. I'm not sure that that keynote speaker would be invited back the next year. But that's what Isaiah is saying to the Israelites. Calamity will come, but the calamity is not the last word. For the Lord has called you by name. He has made you and will not give up on you. He will not give up on you. There will be rushing waters that you might have to cross, but those waters will not sweep you into oblivion. There might be fiery trials you will need to pass through, but you will not be consumed by the flames. There will be chaos like on a stormy ocean, but God will be with you in the lifeboat. You may become separated from those you love for a time and a time and another time, but God says, I will draw you back together. That is Isaiah's message of hope. There are forces in the world, natural and man-made, that will try to stand against you, but God promises in Isaiah, I will not forget that you are mine. I will not forget that you are mine, and I will gather you back again. Perhaps we can learn a lesson from the pandemic, actually, and, and give some glory to God. The pandemic has been a disruption, to be sure. When we first had to take precautions in uh, March, I think March 13th of 2020 was the Sunday that I had to put a note on the door that said, we're not having church today. Uh, in the midst of that disruption, we had to take precautions to slow or stop the spread among us. We were scattered in our homes, but thanks to Stump and Hunt and others and cell phones and the people that make the internet and all that, uh, we were able to find a way we started attending church in front of a computer screen, waving and chatting at one another, even though, remember in those days, the signal would drop all the time and all kinds of stuff. It was kind of miserable, but we were connected a little bit. It was like the old days, or, or if you watch apocalyptic movies and someone's listening to a radio signal, scanning, the, and, and they hear, there's someone out here. If you can hear me, get in touch, right? It was kind of like that, almost. We're still going to be together. Though we were scattered, God found a way to regather us. Others started uh, dropping meals on doorsteps for people that couldn't get out. Others started checking on church friends and neighbors they had never reached out to before. Uh, Lori, this, this uh, fundraiser for t-shirts isn't the first thing that you've really jumped into. You keep jumping into stuff, which is great. But you were one to kind of spark the church family tree branches to get us organized in a new way. Because you realize, gosh, if the pastor's got to check on 400 people or so, it's going to be a while before he gets to my door. <laughs> you know? Uh, and so getting together and checking on one another uh, was a gift that you shared, getting organized that way. Though we were scattered, God found a way to regather us, and we're still being gathered. In some cases, we're enlarging our family circle to receive new friends who come from Durham and from other places too. Has anyone said anything mean to you since you've been here? Good job. Good. That's better than the last group that came up from Durham. Well, we are enlarging our family circle to receive new friends who come in search of love and belonging and a sense of being a part of something bigger, being a part of God's plan. So I think it's important for us to read and learn, even memorize these words of prophecy, even when we don't think we need it, even when we can't imagine a circumstance that would merit it. The overtaking of an entire nation, for example, in Isaiah's prophecy, coming to fruition. We should learn it. We should teach our children and our children's children. We should remember whose we are. We should remember that I am a child of God, like the shirts are going to say, so that we remember what God has promised God will do, no matter what fire, what water, what wind, what war, what division may arise. I thought, I didn't know about this or I didn't think of it until uh, at the first service when I looked down. Uh, but I have one of these here. You know what this is? It's not hairspray. It looks maybe like hairspray. It's a fire extinguisher. I asked them if to drive my point home at the 11 o'clock service, I should start a fire and then put it out. They said no. So you have the early service to thank. We haven't needed to use this. It's still the cap hasn't been off. 
but we're going to be glad we've got it that one day when we actually need it, when a candle tips over, or an electric wire, or something shorts out. You know, we're going to, we don't need it until we need it. We don't think we need it. It might just be useful, useless. It's just taking up space. Occasionally I kick it and clank it. But when a fire comes, we're going to need it. Maybe that's a good object lesson for us too with words like this. We don't really feel like we need to know that we belong to God when we're curled up on our grandmother's lap or something like that. But when we're alone, when the fires and the trials come, that's when we're going to need to remember it. So I would commend us during these good times that we commit these words to memory from Isaiah, that we adopt their posture so that we remember what to do when calamity comes. Just like kids in an elementary school practicing a fire drill or a tornado drill. You don't do it when there's a fire. You do it before there's a fire so that if it ever happens, the kids know what to do. During the good times, we practice what it is to be drawn together, to take others into what is kind of a lifeboat of our church family, so that when others are led to us, or when we go out in search of those in need of salvation or rescue, we'll know how to pull them into the boat and share our abundant rations. If we don't hear this message, if we don't commit it to our hearts, we might mistakenly and sinfully come to believe that our lifeboat is for members only. We're already full. But how foolish and sad and tragic and sinful that would be. How wrong and how embarrassed, ashamed we might feel when Jesus asks us why we didn't make room for one more in our lifeboat of the church. God has called us by name, made us in God's image, and we are united in one baptism, one communion, one family. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father. And if I say, Our Father, and you say, Our Father, and we're talking to the same Father, that makes us sister and brother, brother and brother, sister and sister. We belong to one family. Glory to God. So Isaiah shared these words of God before the calamity that was to befall Israel, reminding them and giving hope of how it would end. So we should learn and remember and burn upon our hearts these words that describe God's character and God's promise so that when the hard days come, we will remember. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, Isaiah says, and because I love you, do not be afraid for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, don't hold back. Anything that separates us, I'm paraphrasing here, God will overcome and reunite us. So bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth and everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So bring them, welcome them. And now in the good times, practice living out this prophecy, welcoming all those God would gather so that when or if we are ever scattered, we will remember with hope that God will indeed draw us back together. So may we practice living out the hope that says, no matter what the world may bring, no matter what may come to my town or nation, God knows me and knows the stranger. God formed us and named both of us, and God is drawing us back together. Doing so will lead to many adventures, and adventures are stories worth telling. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, um, praise God that God is in our midst. And I'm asking God right now to, oh, there it is. Uh, for the, the prayer requests, I wanted to share with you, many of you know and are uh, blessed by knowing and have, been, have known for a long time, Carl Jones. Carl's in hospice care now. Uh, his body has been in rapid decline. Uh, he's been on some morphine uh, to control the pain, and his family is gathering around him. He is at home, but please keep Carl and his family, uh, Kay and Burke and, and uh, their sister and, and all of the extended family and friends in your prayer. Uh, may God have mercy and, 
and hold Carl close. We are uh, grateful to see Mike Miller back with us. Mike, after some time in the hospital, we're great. Uh, uh, just thank God to have you back and regaining your strength and health. So praise God for you. Um, we uh, want to remember one of our uh, youngest visitors uh, often, Nathaniel Ilsley. So if you're watching today, Nathaniel and family, uh, we're praying for you. Nathaniel's having uh, some, some significant surgery on his skull uh, this Tuesday. He is, um, uh, has a condition called hydrocephalus, and so they're working to correct some of that on Tuesday. But it's a major surgery, so please keep he and his family in your prayers. We pray for those who are struggling with cancer and other uh, major diagnoses uh, for Ron Johnson and Ronnie King. We pray for uh, Beverly Kales, uh, Betsy Warren, Roland Crawley. We pray for Joe O'Brien and Chris Long. Uh, we pray too for Gene uh, uh, Andrews. And for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, uh, we pray especially uh, for Fran for Charlie Daniel and his family on the passing of Panthea several weeks ago, for Al Cole and uh, David and Melinda Lewis uh, and their extended family as they grieve the passing of their parents. Um, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there others that we might lift up in prayer here this morning? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Mitch Tillett Wood uh, is doing much better and is now able to receive treatments and is feeling better. Praise God for that. Thank you. Are there others? Yes. yes. The family of Danny Morris. The family of Danny Morris. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes. Any others? Let us continue in prayer. We do pray to you, God, as one people, cognizant this morning, recognizing that we are in your lifeboat against the chaos and, and the forces of this world that seek to destroy. We cling to your life at the foot of the cross. We thank you for the love that surrounds us, for uh, friendships and, and companionship that have sustained us for so many years, for new friends that we are about to make God, we pray for your grace that we would be open to receiving and loving and showing hospitality to the stranger. And when we are strangers to others, we pray for that same grace to be abundant, that we might find respite and care. God, we pray for your faith to, to be planted in our hearts and rooted there so that when calamity may come, we would remember that you are the God in whom we trust. You know us, that we, may not, we need not fear for you are with us and will never forsake us. We pray for healing and provision and hope, even in times and places where it seems that such hope is far off. We pray that you would deliver us. Make good on your promises to love us and never forsake us. And hear us now, God, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have uh, been recipients this morning of so many gifts within our church family, gifts of connection and friendship, gifts of uh, fundraisers and creative ideas, gifts of song and music, gifts of art all around us in the form of stained glass uh, installed and designed and given uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, we are cognizant that God continues to ask uh, of our gifts, gifts that he has entrusted you with not only to be used within the walls of the church, but to be given and shared with those outside of the walls of the church. 
We thank God for the stewardship that God has entrusted us with uh, this church and ask that he would continue to lead and guide us. And so we stand and sing uh, the doxology, thanking God for his good gifts. And then we'll sing our closing hymn. COVID, we don't pass a plate, uh, but there is a box in the uh, narthex as you leave. You're welcome to share a gift there to uh, make a way to get it to the office during the week. We're grateful uh, for the generosity of this congregation. Well, uh, we are going to sing our closing hymn. It's one of those times when we can sing words from one song and a tune from another. And so the, the words really fit nicely with the scripture and the message today. The voice of God is calling. It's number 436. Uh, you probably wouldn't recognize that tune if we sang it. So we're going to sing it to the tune of the church's one foundation. or really hear what we're singing. And so I offer this third verse from here as, as our benediction, as a prayer to God. God, we heed your summons and answer. Here we are. Send us upon your errand. Let us your servants be. Our strength is just dust and ashes. Our years are but a passing hour. 
But God, you can use even our weakness to magnify your power. May you go from this place following God's call wherever that may leave, uh, lead, loving, uh, loving your neighbor, loving God, loving yourself. Go in peace. Amen.